Hi, I'm Teresa Elsie. I'm a senior managing editor in the trade division at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, where I direct a group that produces and updates more than 1,000 ebooks yearly, including adult fiction and nonfiction, culinary and lifestyle, YA titles, picture books, and e only products. I began my career in print publishing, though I like ebooks better, and I've also worked at O'Reilly Media, Let's Go, and Cengage. And for this panel on library lending, I am so pleased to introduce. Rose Donahue, who has been with Overdrive for eight years. She leads the content services team, which is responsible for working with Overdrive's many publisher partners and maintaining their ebook, audiobook, and video catalogs. Her first experience with metadata came from nonprofit fundraising. That experience led to a Master of Library and in Information Science with a focus on digital libraries, which further fueled her passion for quality metadata in service of readers. Maria Cipriano is a senior collection specialist at the Toronto Public Library and is responsible for adult digital collections, including ebooks, digital magazines, and other streaming services. She has over 25 years of collection development experience in public libraries and is a keen advocate of digital collections. Maria is also actively involved in staff training and community outreach. When she's not frantically adding ebooks to the library collection, she can be found reading an ebook at her cottage. Please join me in welcoming them. Simple little buried underneath. So we're going to take you on the journey of an ebook from its ingestion by Overdrive through its rival in a customer's hands via the library. So we'll start with Rose telling you about what happens to your book once you send it to Overdrive. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you today. I don't often get out to see um, all of you behind the scenes person as a behind the scenes person myself. So for my first question to you is, who has a library card? Oh, lovely. I knew you would. If you don't, talk to Maria afterwards, and she will get you hooked up. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how your lovely ebooks get in the hands of our lovely library ebook readers. So founded in 1986, Overdrive launched our content distribution services in 2000, and we're now the leading provider of digital content to libraries and schools across the world with about 95% market share with public libraries. We have a catalog of 2 million ebook audiobook and video, video titles. And today we're talking about that supply side of our business. So how does your ebook get to a reader? One of the questions we're frequently asked is, does Overdrive make ebooks and audiobooks? And this audience today knows the answer is no, we do not. Overdrive has distribution relation, excuse me, relationships with over 5,000 publishers to sell their digital content to our school and library partners. Publishers send their titles to our master catalog where our school and libraries can make their purchases according to their collection development requirements. So this is very similar to how libraries add content to their physical collections as well. They have rules where they make their selections for print content and they apply that to their ebook selections as well. When you browse your library's Overdrive collection, what you're seeing there is what your library has selected from Overdrive's master catalog. So they're, just like there's an entire world of print books that aren't available at your library, it's the same with our ebook collection. So I, I think we probably are a room of people who are, yeah, but how does that work? So, okay, but how? So here's where my team, Content Services, comes in. We work with the publishers every day to upload and manage their catalogs with Overdrive. Deliveries are coming in constantly to our FTP from all over the world, including brand new titles, updates to existing titles, and also those withdrawal from sale notifications. A delivery can contain anything from one title to 1,000 titles. It can be backed by an automated system, or there could be you know, just an author out there who is manually uploading their one little title to us for processing. Each publisher has a manager on my team who's very familiar with their workflow, their files, their metadata, so that they can answer questions and help resolve any issues that the publisher might have. A delivery can consist of a combination of metadata, cover art, and source files. And for that, 
For us, that does include ebook, audio, and video. We track those deliveries start to finish in our system and then let publishers know once the content is live. So delivery breakdown. The first thing that we work with is metadata. And we do get metadata in two separate formats from publishers, Onyx, or a custom XLS template that is OverDrive specific. Metadata is everything you see on a library site that tells you about the title, author, cover art, awards assigned, not assigned, won, awards won. But it's also going to include business terms between the publisher and OverDrive, so pricing and sales rights. The two forms that it comes in, Onyx and XLS, are both batch processed into our system. And if anything is going to prevent import, that gets reported back to publishers so that they can resolve whatever that issue is and resend to us. We do have a minimum set of metadata that's required for a title to make it into our system at all. And these requirements relate back to a higher standard of expectations that are set by our library customers. And there is real value in good metadata, and Maria is actually going to talk about that later. So what does it actually look like on, well, not quite on our side, but how do we get metadata into our system? Onyx is a standard. Everybody has their own flavor of how they actually send it over to us, which is fine. But that does mean that every time we get a new publisher who sends us Onyx, we have to do crosswalking between how they've set up their data in their Onyx feed and then how we're going to get it into our system. So we check each field to see, OK, where's the title? OK, here's the title in our system. We match all of that up, select a product identifier from the Onyx feed, save that in our system. And then once that's established, updates can just manually, or excuse me, automatically flow in without any event intervention from, our, from my team. If a publisher changes the structure of their Onyx data, imports break. And in that case, we reach out to publisher contacts to confirm the meaning of the changes as well as making sure that the changes are intentional. Sometimes somebody just made a change and they didn't mean to, or sometimes they have actually made a significant change to their business terms, but they didn't communicate that ahead of time. So we're like, oh, like, hey, let's, let's talk about what this means and get the business side involved. Not all publishers are Onyx capable, which is fine. If you only have a catalog of five titles, you probably don't want to be dealing with Onyx. So we do have a custom XLS metadata template that publishers can send to us. While we ask that publishers just send us new titles on this template, it's usually a blend of new titles and updates to existing titles. However, we don't know which is which, and we don't know what fields are being updated on existing titles. Since there isn't a concept of a product ID in this template, my team does manually parse out all the titles that are new, all the titles that are updates, and then we batch process those two things separately. The crosswalking here is much more simpler, but we do have to do it every time we run an import. We're data people. We love doing this. It's fun. It's like a puzzle. You know, if you want to sort things out, you know, like go from like rainbow, you know, like red to blue, whatever it is. We just like putting things order in order. So data mapping is a big deal with us, and we spend way too much time on it. Next, we have our actual ebook files that come in in a delivery. And files are not necessarily or usually delivered at the same time as the metadata. Usually, the metadata and cover art come first, followed by the ebook closer to the publication date. This allows us to set the pre order titles available for pre order, which is great for librarians because then they can buy those titles, add them to their collections, and users can start putting holds on them. And as holds build, then librarians are able to gauge how popular a title is going to be, and they can buy more copies depending on what their collection development rules are. When files do come in, they're matched up to the metadata via a shared identifier, usually ISBN, but it can be a wide range, or wide range of identifiers depending on the publisher's complexity. EPUB, by far our favorite format, and just echoing all of the conversation that's been going on. Um, and EPUB is our favorite because of the compatibility across reading systems. Um, all files that come through to OverDrive have to pass the most recent version of EPUB check, so 4.0.2. And if not, we do just put those files on hold or report it back to the publisher and wait until we can get a revised file. If one question that we do get is if you already have a title that's live and an ebook file in place, 
and you send through the file again and it fails EPUB check for whatever reason. Maybe there's been an update to the um, check since you last sent it through. Do we pull your title from sale? The answer is no. It's, it'll stay there until you have a file that will pass EPUB check and at that point we do process it and it will overwrite the old file and libraries will get that new file. Okay, so I know we're talking about eBooks today, but we also do audio, so I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into how we process our audio files. Audio files are delivered in a variety of naming conventions. Sometimes they're named chapter one, chapter two, track one, track two. In this example, the publisher has chosen to name the files by the title of the book. Tracks don't necessarily line up with the structure of a print or ebook, so track one doesn't necessarily equal, equal chapter one to chapter two. So my team actually listens to the beginning of every single track that comes through and figures out where the breaks are and then add in the navigation that you actually see in our app, which is what you see on the other side of the screen. So we've got metadata, we've got ebook files and audiobook files. And then you get the final product. This is what it looks like in our system. So what happens next? Content Reserve is our master catalog where that powers all of our other platforms. So the first place that your content goes is Marketplace, which is the platform that our librarians use to make purchases and manage their collections. And is all content available to all librarians? It's going to, they're going to see what is available to them based on the sales rights provided in the metadata as well as any other restrictions that the publisher is going to have. Then we have our reader-facing platforms such as Overdrive's website, our apps, and these present the titles that your librarian has purchased for your collection. And then lastly, we have Overdrive Connect, which is our publisher portal, which maybe some of you are familiar with, but it does give publishers insight into what their catalog looks like. Each of these platforms use the same metadata, cover art, and ebook files. However, each makes different choices of presentation based on what their audience is going to be interested in. So your title might look a little bit different depending on the product and what they've decided is most important. Great. So how is this different than retail? Once a digital collection is purchased by a library, it stays in their collection. It needs love, it needs attention, it needs updating even when it's no longer for sale because readers are gonna keep checking out your backlist content, which is good news. It just means that you might hear about an ebook from 2005 that needs some love and attention. The other thing that's very different than most retail is that libraries aren't supporting one type of reading device. They have the reading device that their patron comes in and says, I've got this and I've got that. So again, it's a, broader challenge, yes, <laughs> yes in, in figuring out compatibility. Since Overdrive's catalog launched in 2000, there are titles that have been available in library collections for a very long time. Readers are still checking them out. This title has not died. It's been live for 17 years. So here are things that you might hear from Overdrive, about from Overdrive. When readers or librarians run into problems with their eBooks, they report that back to the OverDrive support team who does some testing. And once they've run through their initial data collection process, they pass that over to my team and content services and we do a little bit of additional research. And if we do find that there's a problem with the file, then we're gonna reach back out to the publisher for some help. This is a challenging area for us. Some publishers are very responsive, want to get the file fixed, <laughs> Yay, Teresa. Um, and, and are generally very good partners. Um, some publishers want to debate the philosophies of ebook construction with us, which is fine, but ultimately we just need a new ebook at the end of the day. Let's go. Um, and, but m a lot of publishers do not respond to us at all. The, not only is this frustrating, but it does have a impact on business as well. If a file isn't working and we go back to a publisher and we don't get any response, then we're gonna remove that title from the library's collections. And not just the library who reported as a problem, but all libraries who purchased it. So that re results in a lost sale for everyone. At the end of the day, we all want to drive sales and we all want a quality reader experience. 
So we're working, we're all working in the same environment to make that happen. And from here, I'm actually gonna pass things off to Maria to talk about what happens when titles are being viewed by librarians. Yes, I'm an expert in Overdrive Marketplace. I spend way, way too much time in there. Um, so my job is to select and merchandise adult e-books uh, and audiobooks. Um, so I'm a professional book shopper, which is pretty neat. Um, and I'm an e-book pusher. I am the person that your parents warned you about. Um, Toronto, I'm happy to report, is the global leader in ebook circulation for three years in a row. Yay, Toronto! Woo! Own the podium. Um, we uh, circulated uh, over five million ebooks uh, last year. We had a 25% growth rate in circulation, and we're on target to do it again this year. Um, I look at about a quarter of a million titles a year, um, and I add about 30,000 to the Overdrive collection a year. So, why are they so popular? First, 24-7 access. Our collections are available when the libraries close. That's pretty sweet. Um, the tax dollars fund the collections, so customers get the books for free, but the trade-off is they have to wait, sometimes months, for really popular books. Um, we don't impose any late fees, um, and we have a pretty good collection, if I do say so myself. Mobile apps like Libby have made the borrowing process much easier than it was when I, uh, six years ago when I first started doing the job, where I had nothing but complaints about Adobe Digital Editions. Um, I don't even want to go there. Um, I now have the ability to curate collections, which means I can do reader's advisory, and um, I can highlight books from various parts of the world. It's really been great, and I get very few Your Collection Sucks emails anymore. So that makes me happy. I can't stress enough how digital lending has become a game changer for print disabled people and for customers who are, sh are shut in. Elderly and disabled customers are often on fixed incomes and can't afford to buy all their reading material. They often read a lot, four to five books a week. Um, and it's one of their main forms of their income. Digital collections have empowered these customers. Um, they no longer have to rely on the monthly ebook deliver, um, book delivery that we did through our home library service where we selected the books. They are now empowered to select their own books. Um, I love the fact that every ebook can be a large print book. I like a nice big type when I'm reading. And audiobooks are great for people with print disabilities. Libraries have to comply with disability legislation. It is no joke. We must provide e -book, uh, books in as many formats as possible by law. Um, and in my view, in a civilized, enlightened um, civilization, um, economic status or disability should not prevent you from reading a book. My view is no reader should be left behind. The world is a much better place for me these days than it was when I first started doing the job. I have access to so much more content. It's great. But there's still room for improvement. We have really good access to U.S. content, oh, but we still struggle to get Canadian and international content, which is really surprising. Many U.S. libraries have access to titles that are unavailable in Canada. We're talking Louise Penny. We're talking the audiobook version of the best kind of people. We're talking the wonder. This doesn't seem right to me for a number of reasons. Firstly, some of these books um, and authors um, received taxpayer funding through grants, which I fully, fully support. But the, these books are not available to the, the same taxpayers through their library. Secondly, I have to comply with disability legislation, but I can't provide these books for people if they're not being sold to me in the first place. And the situation is dire for audiobooks. There's so many books that I would love to be able to get, but we can't get. You know, I know that there are subscription services, but some of Audible, for example, um, if they hold exclusive rights to Canadian books, that, that means no library or even Kobo, the retail 
side of things does not have access to these books. I mean, this doesn't seem right. I would really love, uh, love it if publishers could take back control again. Pricing and licensing models, I could speak for hours on this, <laughs> and I won't. Um, the price, th these can uh, vary widely. Um, pricing has really improved since I first started selecting books, but there's still room for improvement. We need to strike a balance where books are still affordable to libraries while ensuring that authors, publishers, and retailers still make a profit. I think we can all play nice in the sandbox. TPL is super well-funded. I'm really, really lucky, but even I struggle to buy adequate copies to meet demand, and sometimes people are waiting six months for a book. The rising US dollar has also hit us pretty hard. And I'll just say this about expiring content. I'm fine with it as long as it's priced well, but the double whammy of having an expensive book that expires within a year or two is unsustainable. So we, we need to talk. Ebook usability, I talked about this last year. By and large, uh, things have improved dramatically. You guys are doing a great job. Um, but there's still room for a little bit of uh, work and improvement, especially for books that incorporate text with images, maps, and other figures. Um, I'm thinking uh, some of our comic books don't work so well. Um, travel guide books practically drive me to drink. <laughs> we need to do some work in that area. Um, I don't think that ebooks sh should necessarily be facsimiles of print books. They need to be designed to provide a good uh, user experience on the wide variety of devices, and people walk into the library branches with devices I have not ever seen before. So kudos to our frontline staff who have to deal with this. Um, and I know we've talked about accessibility time and time again, but accessibility features are extremely important because we have to comply with legislation. And I said this last year, and I'll say it again. We don't want to see PDFs, we want EPUB 3. So I'm going to talk a little bit about metadata issues that um, drive me crazy and that might be costing you book sales. So one of the things that drives me nuts are books that don't have covers. Um, it's not just an aesthetic thing, they don't circulate well. Um, customers don't touch them. So library budgets are closely tied to circulation statistics. So we won't spend our budget on content that doesn't circulate. It's a fact. And for certain types of books, our motto really is no book cover, no sale. This is especially true in children's books. Um, if there is no cover, this is what, uh, you know, they get a generic cover. It just doesn't sell the book to kids. And, we, and our children's selector won't buy them. The other area is romance. God, how I love buying romance books. They're so much fun. Um, the cover <laughs> really sells the book. It's super important. You know, our brains are programmed to process images far faster than words, so you can gauge whether you want to read that book or whether I'm going to buy that book in, within seconds. I, there's a certain cover type I know will get me a ton of holes um, in Cirque, and I am a Cirque, uh, Cirque whore. I will buy it, and I'll buy lots of copies of it. Um, so, you know, clean romance is, you know, it, it tells people, uh, like, they, they covers the light palette, the bonnets, the flowers, they, they, it says, oh, you know what, they probably don't even hold hands in this book, you know, that's safe for me. Um, sizzling romance, it's all about the torsos, it's all about the darker colors, it's going to be hot. And if you were wondering whether Torontonians prefer clean or sizzling, here's your answer. Okay? <laughs> The, <laughs> the slightly same author, same series, usually book one in series does much better. In this case, less clothes sold the book. Just saying. If it had no cover, it would be the kiss of death for circulation, and we don't want that. Expose yourself and your metadata. Expose your metadata, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so title and author. Wow, this is like, I, I, I see books pre pub I'm going, should I get this book? I don't know. You know, um, you know, titles are the most frequently searched, uh, used search attribute, and if a customer or, my, or I'm looking for something and I don't find it and I try a whole bunch of different ways, your content is invisible. It's fatal to have errors in these two fields, and I can report issues to overdrive, but I look at a quarter of a million books. I don't have time to be filling out the support form like 50 times a day. If it's a borderline book, I just skip it. It's not worth my while. Publication date drives me crazy, okay? 
So picture it, I come in, I say, yo, Overdrive, show me what you released today, and I get a thousand releases by one publisher, all with the same date, usually it's that date. I'm going, I don't think so. I don't think these books are all brand new books. Libraries have fixed budgets. We have to prioritize our spending with, you know, I buy, I, my, I prioritize new material and I buy select older titles. If I have to check a thousand titles against an authoritative source to find out when that book was published, I might just skip that entire release if I think it's mostly old stuff. So it doesn't pay to hide your brand new releases in large data dumps. It's the other thing, it's, it, it's like feast or famine, you know, at Christmas when every, the office is full of candy and chocolate and the first day you're going, yay, candy, chocolate, and you're stuffing your face, uh, but then it's too much of a good thing and you get tired of it. I also get buyer's fatigue. So if you release your whole entire catalog um, in you know, one go, um, and I have to look at 8,000 of your titles, I'm probably going to buy a lot fewer overall than if you gave them to me in chunks of 200. It's just the way it is. So in my view, publication dat date should really reflect the date when the content was last updated. I um, have to follow our weeding and retention guidelines for our ebooks, just like I do for when I bought print, and we don't keep old medical or legal information, it's, it's not helpful to our customers. And I don't want to come back and say that some, somebody comes to me and says, oh, I lost my court case because I, I, I was using a, a, a law book from 1982, right? So we try and keep it up to date. Series information, so important to include a series title and a series number because in OverDrive, people can click on the hyperlink and it'll display your series all in one page as long as it's uh, consistently named. And customers will say, buy this book, you don't have book three in the series, and we do, but it's just that it didn't have a series uh, title or you know, it had a slight variation in the way it was named. Um, customers love to read books in order, so it's great to include the series number. And I like to see it too, so when I see a book, I go back and I think, oh, do I have the whole book in the series? Because I always strive to have the whole series. Because if I don't buy, do a preemptive strike and get it, when I see it, the customers will tell me they want it. Toronto Public Library customers are extremely engaged and they keep me on my toes. I can't even take vacation. Bisex subject headings. This is an actual email we received a couple weeks ago, so I, I screen capped it and brought it here because I thought it was kind of fun. So um, one of our customers was looking for literary books and instead she got a whole bunch. She clicked on the literature category, and I guess I'd done a large romance release, and a bunch of those probably had the following bisacks. They probably had fiction, romance, and literature. Well, that really screws up the browsing experience. You know, the Harlequin romance is great, and I love romance, but, you know, it's not really literature, so it makes it difficult for the customer, and I can't do a thing to change that. So applying the correct uh, subject heading to the correct specificity really enhances the browsing experience. Otherwise, people get frustrated. The romance people can't find their content and the literature people have to wade through so much stuff that you know they get discouraged. Um, and the browsing categories then lack credibility. So to be clear, the marriage plot by Jeffrey Eugenides really uh, should have two categories, uh, literature and fiction. And Thong on Fire by Noir <laughs> should only have fiction and romance, but if you really want to stretch things, I'd accept educational, because I learned a lot from <laughs> <laughs> Digital rights. Okay, so every day I log in, I go, ooh, I wonder what's, what can I buy today? Yay, Ruth Ware's book is finally available. I've been waiting for it for so very long. It's on the bestseller list. My customers are gonna be absolutely delighted. So I add it, and 400 holds get placed on it. Two weeks later, it gets pulled. It gets pulled because it was the British edition, and then the correct edition gets, uh, shows up in Marketplace later. So 
I have to get rid of it. I can't add any more copies. Or it may just disappear. It goes to zero copies. What happens, though, is the holds stay on that. So then I manually, I have to manually delete 400 holds. It can take upwards of half an hour. That makes me extremely cranky. It's never a good idea to have a cranky librarian on your hands, honestly. Then I have to go and find another copy of it. So it's very important to make sure before you send out that feed that it has the correct rights. Keywords, they are super important for so many reasons. Um, it's, you really should choose specific and relevant keywords that really enhance and supplement the title and the description because it'll, it'll increase discoverability. It also makes my job so much e easier because I spend a great deal of time pushing content at people. Um, I try and find available books to increase my circulation and um, I'm always looking for different and things, or I do specific thematic collections, like, uh, for example, Black History Month books or Indigenous People collection, or maybe in my staff picks I want to find some Indigenous authors, and it's really hard for me. I have to do a lot of research if I don't know the books off the top of my head. So having that keyword there would be great. You know, like when I do my Scandinavian, like super bloodthirsty mystery list, it'd be great if I could just put in Iceland, Finland, you know, for all those Wallander type books. Like I know a lot of them, but there's so many in there and I can't find it. So if I could search by geographic region or if that could be a keyword, It'd be great. You know, um, we need to promote diversity. Our city is very diverse. I want to make sure that I, I have fiction from all over the world. I'd like to be able to highlight it and push it at our customers. And I just want to say one thing to you. Um, I want to thank you all for the work that you do. I'm amazed at what you can do and how well you code. And everything that you do just blows my mind. Um, Toronto Public Library customers are big, big lovers of ebooks, and they would thank you themselves if they could. So I'm going to say it right now. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Rose. I have a few questions for these folks, and then we'll leave a few minutes for you guys to ask questions. Um, but I actually wanted to start with some audience participation. Rose already asked you the library cards question, but who here has now checked out an ebook or an audiobook through their public library? Good adoption here. Good work, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and who here is creating and distributing books to the library market? Do you know if your ebooks are going there? Quite a lot as well. Okay, so I have the developers in the room for you. Excellent. These guys are going to tell you what they want you to know. Um, I think you've addressed a lot of the, like, as ebook developers, what should we be thinking about for the library market, not just thinking about the retail market, which I think is something that we've focused on a lot. Um, one minor question I wanted to pick up, because we've talked about metadata a lot. We've talked about the Onyx metadata or the external spreadsheet metadata that we're sending out with our ebooks. But, Rose, I wonder if you could talk about the degree to which OverDrive and libraries look at the metadata that actually tr is inside the ebook file. Is that of interest to you? Do you use that? What is your philosophy about that versus the Onyx metadata? We don't use any of the internal EPUB metadata in our customer facing platforms. It is really a grab bag in terms of quality. So we work with a metadata that is provided via the XLS or the Onyx feed. Um, of course, we do use the metadata that tells our uh, readers how to display content. But really, it's too varied to really rely on um, to display to customers right now. It's easier for you to match up the metadata that's being sent separately than to use what's actually provided in the file. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, Maria, you alluded to the different sorts of devices that your libraries have to support. Do you have any statistical or anecdotal idea about what kind of devices your readers tend to be using? Um, the last time I looked in our OverDrive re reports, um, by and large, uh, these days, more people are going in using mobile devices. They love the app, so they're using either um, smartphones or they're using um, uh, tablets. Uh, but the hardcore readers, and there are many of them, really love their dedicated e-reader. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. And some people um, still oh, they use their PCs. They, they read on their PC. It, and do you recommend specific devices or platforms if I come to you and say, I want to start reading ebooks? I tend to um, encourage people to get a tablet. It doesn't have to be a fancy one because not only do we uh, offer uh, ebooks, but we also offer digital magazines. And 
you know, it's a much better user experience uh, using the tablet, so if they can afford it, like a, a little iPad mini or the Android equivalent is what I would tell them to get. One thing we discussed a little among ourselves, but I think didn't come up today, is enhancements in eBooks. Do you find there's demand among your customers for certain kinds of enhancements in eBooks? And maybe you could comment on what OverDrive is able to support in terms of enhanced eBooks. Yeah, so we do support fixed layout eBooks as well as narrated eBooks, so with an audio overlay. We don't support embedded audio or video because it doesn't have the compatibility that we need, and we don't support interactive elements, again, because it just doesn't work across enough devices. It tends to be too custom designed. But I know that the audio narrated books have been popular. Yeah, the the, uh, the books, the picture books for children that have the uh, read along, like so it highlights, it's got the image and the text um, highlighted are really great. The, the schools were asking for this as well, parents, schools, kids really love it. And um, just two days ago, I, I got an email from a mom of an older child. She said, oh, I'd love it if it had the same kind of thing for middle school. Like they... Need, like you know, they need a little bit of their child has uh, a, a reading disability, and so they're looking for any kind of enhancement like that. That's great. I mean, and, and I often wonder, like, because when I'm, I obsessively watch that dashboard of ours, I think it was up for a while. It's like, like I call it uh, Librarian TV, um, and to see what people are doing, and I'll see the following ebook, audiobook. They'll check out or hold ebook, audiobook. So, you know, in, in the perfect world, we could, you know, get a file that has both so people can switch between one and the other. You know, I would love that, that could happen, but I just can't imagine how much that might cost. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and of course, we're always interested in learning about user experience. Are there things that you're seeing that customers are struggling with with ebooks, about things that they consistently don't understand about how ebooks work? They don't understand the, the biggest complaint I get is they don't understand why they have to wait for the book. And uh, they don't, oh, it's, it's a file, well, why can't I get it immediately? And I say, well, listen, uh, people have to pay their bills and it wouldn't be a great user experience, or it wouldn't be a great experience for the author if they made their book available and then the whole population of Toronto could access it at once and the retailer would see no additional sales that you know they don't understand that so I explain the one copy one user thing I say that that has to be in place in order for us to be able to all work uh, in the a publishing ecosystem and I have to say this one thing because I get a lot of complaints you're buying way too many romance books of course the romance readers say you're not buying nearly as many romance <laughs> books but as you should but I want to say that in, in this publishing ecosystem at the library that um, for you folks that want your literary books you may not realize that the low-cost romance that I buy reams and reams of copies of basically cross subsidizes everything else that they have in overdrive. So thank you, Harlequin, and all the others that <laughs> produce romance. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and maybe along those lines, Maria, I'm curious how one goes about becoming the global leader in ebook circulation, and if possibly there's something the rest of us could learn from that about encouraging the spread of ebook reading generally. Well, you have to want to be number one really, really badly. <laughs> so I approach my job just like I do my plants versus zombies. I go for a really high body count. I was, uh, I was, when I found out there was a ranking of libraries based on circulation and Toronto Public Library wasn't even in the top five, I, I gave myself a couple of years to get us to number one and I did it and this is how I did it. I didn't sleep much. Um, I obsessively checked <laughs> all the content in overdrive against books that we had in our print collection to see if they're going out well. I bought those books. I bought uh, all the bestsellers. I bought all the books that won awards from various years. I, uh, I, then I watched to see what our customers were doing, what they were checking out. I ran tons of statistical reports and I bought more of what they wanted and less of what they didn't want. Um, and you know, then I um, realized that many people didn't even know that we had ebooks, so I made it my personal mission to spread the word. I am Toronto's ebook pusher, after all. And I got our marketing department to run a TTC 
campaign to let them know that we had them. And then I do numerous outreach events. Um, we go to the universities, we go to the subway, we go to the mall, and I will ambush you when you're going about <laughs> doing your own business. I am, I'm very proud, I am the queen of the ambush. Um, and we'll go to frosh events, and I, I'm always trying not to poach from the print people because my coworkers don't like the idea of me taking their readers. So I'm always going after people who maybe are not traditional readers, like millennial males that may spend all their time on Reddit. I will go to the university, I'll see a young 20-something guy, and I will go with a huge bowl of like amazing mango candy, and I will go up to them and say, hey, want a candy, <laughs> little boy? <laughs> I'm from the library. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a nice person, don't worry. Um, and then while they're unwrapping, I lure them over to my table. I whip out my iPad that is full of great content, eBooks, magazines, The Economist. We've got The Economist. We've got Lynda.com, and I do my whole elevator pitch to them, and um, then I tell them if they want a second piece, they have to get a library card, and people basically do what I tell them. They get <laughs> So last fall, we uh, did three events, one at Ryerson, one at U of T, one at York, and I signed up 750 people with library cards. So once, you know, build the collection and they will come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and once they start using it and they love it, they will tell people, you cannot really discount word of mouth as being the most effective way to spread the word. Along those lines, if you didn't raise your hand for having checked out a library book, please see Maria after the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I believe she has candy. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, but are there audience questions? Uh, Rob Clement from Ingram is my name. And uh, I had a question about your slide about availability of, of Canadian titles in the Canadian market. What do you think is the real problem there? Uh, is it exclusivity of the contracts that publishers are entering into that prevents you from getting those titles? Is it uh, Heritage Canada legislation which prevents you from sourcing from the US? What, 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 what's your perspective on that as a, as a library buyer? I think it's just an oversight. Somebody just forgot. They forgot to negotiate the rights for us and Canada, Compared to the U.S., is a relatively small market. I will squawk about things, but you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that that's what it is because it kind of makes me sad to think that people are, you know, if they're willfully trying to shut libraries out. I'm hoping it's the former. Uh, so, a second question mm -hmm. then for our Overdrive representative: Do you offer through Overdrive a exclusively Canadian ingestion point? Um, for ebook content uh, that would allow a Canadian distributor to make or publisher to get titles into Canadian distribution only. So we don't have an exclusive Canadian ingestion point, but whatever rights a title will, or excuse me, a publisher provides us with will limit where the titles go. So if a Canadian publisher only wants to sell to Canadian libraries, that's something that they can tell us in the rights. And, 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 they, and they can exclude the U.S. market entirely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Because we're supplying titles to libraries internationally, we're also working with multiple divisions of the same publishing house, so Penguin UK, Penguin US, Penguin Australia, so that's where making sure we're selling, selling the correct title into the correct region is very important and something yeah, that we're no, very that, aware that's of. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think we're out of time here, but thank you so much. <laughs>